afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the American Floral Endowments Grow Pro webinar series. I am your moderator today, Dr. Melinda Knuth. I received my PhD in horticulture from Texas A&M University, and I am now an assistant professor at North Carolina State University, investigating consumer attitudes and behaviors for edible and ornamental horticulture crops. Today's se session is on successful handling and propagation of unrooted cuttings. On behalf of the endowment, I'm excited to be part of AFE's GoPro series that features a new topic each month presented by an industry expert. The webinars are free to everyone thanks to the generous support of AFE sponsors. This session is sponsored by Ball Flora Plant and Darwin Perennials. Ball Flora Plant is a leading brand of vegetative propagated plant varieties. Darwin Perennials supplies North American growers with superior genetics for the ever expanding perennial market. If you'd like to learn more about our sponsors, or if you're a supplier and interested in becoming a sponsor for a topic, you can fill out information at AFE's website at endowment.org GrowPro. Today's session was pre-recorded in English by Dr. John Dole. After the presentation, we will have a question and answer session. P please feel free to submit your questions through the question and answer feature or the chat at any time. We'll answer as many live as we can before the end of the hour. Any unanswered questions may be answered through a separate email exchange. This session is being recorded and will be shared to AFE's YouTube account. Through YouTube's accessibility features, you can access closed captioning in other languages. To get us started, I'd like to share a bit about today's expert speaker, Dr. John Dole. John is an Associate Dean and Director of Academic Programs and was recently named the Interim Dean for the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at North Carolina State University. A renowned floriculture expert, he conducts research on cut flowers, unrooted cuttings, and several floriculture crops. John teaches a graduate level physiology of flowering course and has authored or co-authored eight books. With AFE support, John has made significant contributions to post-harvest research, especially cut flowers. John, thank you and welcome for presenting today on Unrooted Cuttings. Thank you, Melinda. I'm so much looking forward to being here. I appreciate the invitation. Uh, we're gonna be talking about successful handling and propagation of unrooted cuttings. And I wanna start by saying that this has been a long-term cooperative project. Uh, while I'm doing the presentation, it includes research done by my cooperator, Jim Faust, Clemson University, who continues to work with uh, propagation and handling of unrooted cuttings. We're very pleased and thank you to the sponsors, Ball Flora Plant and Darwood Perennials uh, for their support of this session and for their support of the industry in general. So this, uh, we're gonna start right off with, uh, with the stages. Uh, there are five stages for the efficient rooting of cuttings. Uh, first is looking at prior to arrival. What do we need to do to get ready? Uh, the next one there is arrival and sticking. Then we go to callusing, root development, and toning. Um, I'm pretty much going to focus just on the first two stages here uh, in more detail. In general, though, as we go from zero to, as we go from one to four, uh, we see that uh, we need to decrease the amount of water that we're providing, either that be through mist, fog, or humidity. Uh, we increase the light. Um, in some cases, we might also change the fertility and that sort of thing. But in general, uh, we're, as we go to the final stage in toning of the cuttings, uh, we're reducing the water that's being applied and we're increasing the light. Well, let's go ahead and start with the first stage there prior to arrival. Sanitation, sanitation, sanitation. If there's one thing you remember, please, please remember the sanitation. Uh, clean out that cooler, uh, look at the traffic flow, where the cuttings will be uh, staged, that sort of thing. Employee clothing and hands, make sure that's clean. Uh, bench tops, under the bench. Under the bench, yes, we often forget that because um, it's under the bench and it's not really obvious. You know, are there, are there weeds growing there with, this, you know, insects and diseases? I'll be sure to get that cleaned out, the trays, and then of course the equipment. Um, we're talking about prior to arrival of the cuttings. Um, and this is usually something we do at the beginning of the propagation season. Having said that, 
uh, please keep in mind that these are things we should look at all during the propagation session or uh, season. Um, so it's not just at the beginning, um, but make sure to periodically uh, go through this list and check to make sure, because it's not unheard of that problems start to crop up in the middle of propagation uh, because we weren't paying attention to uh, sanitation and some of these other things when we really got into the heat of the season and there's a lot going on. Uh, training, boy, we can't overstate the importance of that. It impacts all the stages, especially zero and one. Uh, we're gonna go through some of these here in a minute. Ongoing and requires commitment. Uh, this is not something one just does uh, on the fly. You know, we've got new folks in, we're gonna go ahead and spend a few minutes telling them uh, how to handle and propagate cuttings, but it has to be regular, regular. And this can be hard, especially for the ongoing employees. Um, they have a, you know, we've all been there. We've had a training. Uh, we've heard it all before. It's hard not to roll our eyes. Uh, but the fact is, um, if we don't repeat the trainings periodically, uh, people tend to drift. They drift off mark uh, in terms of what they need to be focusing on. Uh, so regular trainings, even for ongoing and established employees is very important. So what sorts of things do we wanna train over? Unboxing, we'll be talking about that here in a minute. Sorting, assessing quality. Uh, you know, are the cuttings what you need them to be? Uh, processing, how to handle them, the prioritizing, which ones need to be stuck first? Uh, the sticking, how to stick, which, uh, what are the process for sticking? And then of course, scouting if we see insects and diseases. All right, we're gonna start with the, the number one take home message. Uh, maximizing performance of underrated cuttings is a measure of time versus temperature, temperature versus time, okay? Um, and one of the first things we wanna do upon arrival is, is figure out how to handle them, okay? Um, plan A is to stick immediately. Plan B is to hold the cuttings in a cooler for less than 24 hours. Plan C is to hold cuttings on a propagation bench uh, for less than 24 hours. And plan D is to store cuttings for more than 24 hours. Okay, that's really not recommended, but it certainly can work uh, in some situations. Let's go ahead and start with the first plan there, plan A. Okay, these are the ones that need to be stuck immediately. Uh, they're the ones that are poor shippers or storers. Uh, coleus, Chrysandra, Euphorbia hybrids, Lantana, Portulaca, sweet potato. Uh, the photo is there is a Portulaca. And if you look, you can see on the right, some very nice cuttings there with all the leaves. And then on the left there, you can see these little sticks with a couple of leaves. Uh, Portulaca is very sensitive to ethylene. It's very sensitive to improper handling during shipping and storage. And it tends to show that by dropping its leaves. Not a good thing when you're trying to propagate cuttings if they don't have leaves. And then, of course, we've got some difficult to root species in cultivars such as Thunbergia uh, in lavender. All of these should be pulled out of the shipment and propagated as soon as possible. Uh, plan B here is to hold cuttings in the cooler prior to sticking for less than 24 hours. Uh, and we'll start here with the temperature. Uh, 50 degrees works for nearly everything. I will say that 35 to 40 has benefits for cold tolerant species. Uh, it goes back to what I mentioned at the beginning, temperature versus time. Uh, the, the lower the temperature, the longer you can hold things at a particular temperature. Geraniums and petunias uh, in particular do very well with this. And then of course, as we look towards the other side of things, a few tropicals prefer 55. Uh, some of them actually get damaged at 50 degrees. So 50 is the general temperature for most things. Some of the things can be stored at 35 to 40. And if you can do that, I would recommend you do do that. Uh, it'll keep the quality better. And then a few of them you wanna keep on the warmer side. All right, so plan B here again, holding cuttings in a cooler for less than 24 hours. Um, when we unpack the boxes, we wanna check and see where the boxes are at in terms of temperature. Uh, this will dictate how we handle those boxes. If we're greater than 70 degrees, and, if, and we will wanna check this with a temperature probe uh, or an IR gun, then we need to remove from the box to cool ASAP. Uh, warm boxes simply don't cool down fast enough. There's a lot of plant material packed in that box. Uh, sometimes there's insulation in that box. 
All of that is great uh, for keeping cool cuttings from warming up, but unfortunately it has the same effect of preventing warm cuttings from being cooled down. So pull them out, spread them out onto trays, put them in the coolers, get that heat out of there as soon as possible. Um, if the cuttings are 60 to 70 degrees uh, and the shipping time has been normal, uh, then the boxes can be put in. Uh, there's not as much urgency in getting the temperature down. Um, so they can, the boxes can be placed in the cooler. You wanna open them up. Okay, you do wanna make that easier, um, but you don't need to go through the effort of pulling the bags out. Same temperature, but if they've been delayed, okay, pull them out, put them on trays, get them as cold as possible. Because while 70, while 60 to 70 is okay in terms of a being an arrival temperature, uh, if they have been at that temperature for quite a while, uh, there will be some cutting deterioration that you're going to want to slow down. If the cuttings come in 50 to 60, which we just really love to see, uh, then the boxes can be placed right in the cooler. And that, of course, is the best situation because there's the least, uh, um, uh, the least hassle involved with taking the cuttings out of the box. All right, uh, plan C, holding the cuttings on the propagation bench. This does have an advantage. Um, you can get some photosynthesis, which can help to start uh, recharge those cuttings with carbohydrates. Because remember, they've been stuck in a box, no light. Um, if they probably receive some warm temperatures, hopefully like we talked about before, have not warmed up too much. Um, so that light can help start to recharge them. Be sure to not stress them out though. Uh, the propagation benches tend to be warm which is fine when we wanna put rot roots on them, uh, but we can be a little bit problematic uh, if we're just storing cuttings. Turn the bottom heat off, turn the mist on. Again, we don't want to, we're not trying to root them in the box, uh, we're trying to hold them. So turn that bottom heat off. And the last, uh, the last choice here is to store for greater than 24 hours. Um, it's not recommended, uh, we just, we have to say that. Uh, but some species store well if the temperature control is excellent. And golly, I wanna reinforce that excellent part. Um, especially in the middle of the season, we will see, you know, been in green or coolers and the temperatures are set just right. Uh, but unfortunately, the actual temperature has drifted up either because folks have tinkered with it or because we put a lot of plant material in the cooler. And even though it's supposed to be at 35 degrees, uh, with all that warm plant material, day after day, it tends to be warmer. So keep that in mind. If your temperatures in your coolers are really what they're supposed to be, uh, then this will work great. Argoranthemum, chrysanthemum in particular, um, osteospermum, petunia, they all can handle it. Um, this cutting, this photo here shows um, some work we did with petunias. And what we noted was that, uh, um, uh, not petunias, impatience here. What we noted was that the cuttings actually were starting to root in the cooler uh, when they were being held for longer than 24 hours. Uh, very intriguing. We tried to make this happen on purpose and we found that we couldn't do it consistently. Uh, wouldn't that be great if we could use the storage time for cuttings to actually shorten the propagation time? And we were able to do that to a certain extent. Uh, we just couldn't get it done reliably. And of course, the roots would develop very quickly, um, but we were trying to figure out how to get them to form callus uh, in the cooler. Anyway, I digress. All right, so this is a, a chart or you know a set of photos here, and I want to point out that these come from Roberto Lopez and Eric Runkle at Michigan State. Uh, boy, that group just does a really great job of taking photos and making things just so clear. Uh, these are just wonderful photos. A lot of work went into this. Um, and so thank you to them for letting us use this. All right, so let me orientate you to the photos here. Uh, we can see on the top row, these were cuttings that were stored at 36 degrees for four, seven, 10, and 13 days. And then as we go down, we can see progressively warmer temperatures. And what they've done here is they pulled out the cuttings after propagation, washed the roots, and showed you, uh, showed you how the roots look. And so let's go ahead and start with the top row there. And although you may not be able to see it very well, there's a circle there. Uh, we can see after 13 days, uh, remember geraniums are one of the cuttings that do, uh, that can handle long-term storage. Uh, we can see that that cutting right there is, has no roots. And then next to it is a cutting 
that is, uh, you know, the roots are pretty wimpy. Some of the cuttings look just fine uh, compared to the other ones, but we can see the beginning of, of lack of rooting and problems. Okay, as we go further along, 41 degrees, here again, we can see a couple of cuttings. Uh, here's a cutting on this photo that may not be as well rooted. And then as we go to 50, and then we go to 50, 59, we can see that even at the shorter durations, we're getting cuttings that are not rooting well. Okay, so uh, that's not a good thing when you're trying to create a uniform batch of cuttings. And so the performance is closely related to the sum of temperatures experienced from cut to stick. And that again goes back to that message I started with at the very beginning, temperature by time, very important interaction there. And what that does, you know, in reality is, is this. Um, and all this is actually not a bad photo, I've seen much worse, but we can see some of the yellowing there. And if we drill down closer, we would see some of those cuttings are behind. And boy, what a frustrating situation that is, is when we've got some of the cuttings that haven't rooted, other cuttings have, the ones that have rooted start to grow, they start to stretch, they start to elongate. So we start losing quality there. Um, but yet we don't wanna move them all out because they're not all rooted. So it turns into a real management challenge. So again, if we handle the cuttings properly, uh, then we will have a nice uniform crop that makes everything go smoother from that point on. Uh, I talked a little bit about temperatures under the various plans. I want to uh, bring it home a little bit more. Uh, and we've got these uh, the species listed into various categories here. Some of them that are moderately cold sensitive, uh, which means they can take it down to 40. Uh, double impatience, uh, heliotrope, New Guinea impatience, poinsettia verbena. A very cold sensitive, which means we don't want to go below 45, coleus cassandra, uh, euphorbia, lantana, portulaca, sweet potato, thunbergia. Uh, then on the other side of things, we have cuttings that don't like being kept very warm. And of course, if you handle everything according to plan A, B, and C, and D, you're not going to have this issue. But nevertheless, just to reiterate, um, it's 60 and 70 degrees there. Uh, some of you are going to look and you're going to notice a couple of those like sweet potatoes. You know, in college, they think, well, golly, those root so fast. Why, do, why are they on the sensitive list here? Um, they do root very fast. Uh, we've worked with sweet potato cuttings. They root amazingly fast. They also can deteriorate amazingly fast. Uh, so keep that in mind that even though some of these root very quickly, um, they are very sensitive because they can uh, deteriorate quickly. Next slide here uh, puts us into a little bit of a, what we call the sticking order here highest priority, high priority, and then moderate priority. Uh, so that means when you get these boxes, if it's a mixed shipment with a lot of different species, go ahead and pull these out, the highest priority, and get them uh, stuck first. And then you can see the, the high priority and moderate priority. And then you know the, the last category there, any species that may ship well, be, but be slow to root. All right, let's take a look at the sticking and handling. Uh, this all has been in the cooler. Uh, now, now let's uh, go into the greenhouse and talk a little bit about that. First of all, take only the number of cuttings that can be stuck within an hour. Remember that temperature by time. Uh, these cuttings are, you know, uh, they are now at the tail end of this store, so they're going to be even more sensitive, especially due to a low carbohydrate status. Um, be aware of upcoming work breaks. Folks need their breaks but um, they shouldn't go off and then leave the cuttings, especially sitting out in the open in particular getting, getting hot. Uh, keeping cuttings out of direct sun while waiting to stick will help as well. Uh, we can see in the photo here, they've unpacked the cuttings, they've got them in the tray, so at least they're not sitting in bags heating up. Um, but if it's a very sunny day, uh, then go ahead and put maybe a little bit of uh, shade cloth on them or a little bit of uh, reme on them. Uh, to keep the temperature down as you pull them out. Okay. All right. So um, this photo, of course, shows a shipment of cuttings. And then within each of these boxes, of course, we've got all the bags. Um, so, you know, this just points out the, the, the shipping of the cuttings. And let's talk about that next. What happens if a shipment is delayed? Okay, we saw all those cuttings, you know, just thousands of cuttings in a shipment. What do we do if that shipment is delayed? Uh, first of all, we're gonna get moisture loss. Uh, those cuttings are gonna start to stress out. 
uh, there's going to be respiration. They're going to start to respire, which means they're going to start using up uh, the carbohydrates uh, that they're within the cutting and possibly increased ethylene sensitivity. We've seen that with a couple of species that as the carbohydrate contents goes down, uh, they become more sensitive to ethylene. Um, and then that just compounds and the problems from there. And of course we get pathogens, uh, botrytis, uh, various bacteria that can just turn those bags to mush in no time at all, unfortunately. Visible symptoms, leaf abscission. I talked, you know, I showed that one photo of Portulaca uh, with the leaves that had fallen off. Uh, yellowing and or necrosis. We saw that in the photo with the geraniums, apical meristem death. Uh, we see that with several different species, disease development. Yeah, boy, we really can see that. And if we don't see these more obvious things, what can be more frustrating in some ways is the slow and uneven rooting because it will mess up your schedules. So the other symptoms are very clear and direct. The slow and uneven rooting, we're not going to see uh, right away. We're going to see that later. And so some ways that can be the worst problem uh, because we don't see it right away quite often. So that leaves us with the question. We've got cuttings that have been delayed. Do we go ahead and propagate them? Okay. And thus run the risk of having poor quality and maybe even cuttings, rooted cuttings that we can't use, or do we replace them, ask for credits, and then we get missed schedules. All right. So difficult decision, what to do there. So what we looked at was, well, is there a middle ground? Can we try to rejuvenate? Can we try to reclaim those cuttings uh, to make them so that we turn it from a low quality product to a high quality product? In particular, can we go ahead and replace the water prior to sticking? And while we're at it, can we go ahead and add other beneficial compounds into that water? So that led us into a series of experiments uh, that we call recovery solutions uh, with the idea that we're trying to recover these cuttings um, after they've been shipped and delayed. Uh, we tested a number of compounds, wetting agents, rooting hormones, fungicides, carbohydrates, cytokinins. Uh, we looked at the big three species, New Guinea impatiens, geraniums, poinsettias, although I will say some of the minor species, uh, this would probably be more beneficial for even more than the majors. Uh, we looked at zero, four, and eight in the first set of experiments. Uh, later on, we just reduced it to until wilting, which was around 48 hours in later experiments. 30-minute uh, dips. Uh, and then, of course, we, un we included undipped cuttings and DI water controls as, uh, as comparisons. All right. So let's take a look at, at the wetting agent. And that was, it was interesting. Uh, we had really good results from just using the wetting agent. Uh, two or four ounces per 100 gallons. Uh, DI water worked without the wetting agent. Uh, the cuttings were turgid, uh, but there still was some flexibility. And I'm gonna show you a photo here in a minute. With capsule, however, or other wetting agents, uh, very turgid. The cuttings were just so easy to stick. Um, you know, with some of these cuttings, they're little tiny things, thin stems, you know, it's just, oh my gosh. Uh, to be able to stick one of those cuttings, they really need to be turgid. And Capsule did that very well. Uh, some data here, of course, because we are researchers, we have to present data. Uh, we've got the species here. We've got the water and water plus Capsule, the initial weight, the final weight. And the ones in red there are the, uh, the increase in weight uh, that was due to this, the dipping of the cuttings. And you can see that water plus Capsule uh, gave us a higher increase in water retention or water uptake uh, than just the water alone. So it turned out very well. And here's a photo. Um, the top photo there, these were cuttings that had been stored for eight days. They're wilted. They're not looking very good. Uh, they've got thin stems. These were a real pain to stick, I will tell you. Uh, but then, boy, look at these ones that had been soaked um, in capsule and water. Those leaves are nice and upright. The, even this thin little stem here, uh, was very easy to stick. So first take home message right there is soaking cuttings in water plus capsule, very helpful in and of itself. So we drilled down further. Uh, we did a kind of a big overall experiment. And so then what we did is we picked out the most successful treatments from that experiment and looked at things in more detail. Uh, KIBA, 500 part per million, BA plus KIBA, uh, the BA there helping to improve uh, you know, keeping the cutting, the leaves of the cutting to green. 
Unfortunately, that can also reduce rooting. So we added in the KIV there to counteract that. A fungicide, in this case, pageant, uh, different rates there for impatiens and geraniums and poinsettias. Um, and if we'd redone this, we probably would have used a different fungicide, but that, I think the, uh, the results gave a good indication there, fructose. You know, we talked about the fact that carbohydrate content goes down in cuttings that are stored uh, because they're respiring and they're using up their sugars. Uh, we had done an experiment where we looked at different carbohydrates and of those fructose did the best. So that's why fructose is in here. Uh, we decided to look at dip durations, either zero or 30 minutes. Uh, zero, just literally dip them in and pull them back out. 30 minutes is let them hold there. And then of course we included the controls that we've talked about in the past. And um, storage duration zero and 48 hours. 48 hours mimicking the stress that would occur in a delayed shipment. All right, species and cultivars. Geraniums here, Rocky Mountain Violet, Tango Dark Red, uh, a Fanfare Orchid and Supersonic White for the Impatience, White Star and Prestige Red uh, for the Poinsettias. Uh, these were selected as ones that typically have a little bit more of a problem with storage and those that are a little bit more durable, uh, just to give you an idea of why, uh, what these cultivars represented. All right, so let's start with geraniums, okay? Um, and let's take a look at the storage duration. And so what we have here is zero hours and 48 hours, and then of course the significance. Um, and let's take a look here at the first two columns, shoot rating and root rating. This is a subjective measurement, um, but we can see that when the cuttings were not stored, this is the zero hours, uh, the shoots look better and the roots look better, okay? Next here is the number of yellow leaves and of size leaves. Uh, we can see that that was lower uh, for the cuttings that were not stored and higher, of course, for the cuttings that were stored and stressed. So take home message there, don't stress them, of course. Fresh weight and dry weight, same thing. Uh, the stress cuttings were lower, which means that they were not as high quality cuttings. And then the final set of data here, uh, root number, okay, and then root length. Uh, we can see here that root length was very similar. Uh, we sometimes see this but we had more roots under the unstored cuttings. And so sometimes we see that when we have more roots, uh, the roots tend not to grow as long. Uh, so in this case, it wasn't a particularly big deal. All right, taking a look at cultivar, um, Rocky Mountain Violet and Tango Dark Red there. We see this, we picked different cultivars with the idea that we would get some variation. And sure enough, we did. And we often hear from growers that certain cultivars are better shippers than others. Some are better propagators than others. And this research just confirms that. I'm not gonna go through all the data, but you can see pretty much here that uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Violet did better in terms of propagation uh, than Tango Dark Red. All right, so let's get to the actual treatments that we, that we talked about, the various compounds that we put in the dip water, okay? I know, big old graph, a lot of abbreviations. Uh, let's start with um, uh, the blue there, that's the root number, and the green there is root length in millimeters. Okay, let's break this down. Take a look at this first one here, and this is capsule. Okay, this is one of our control treatments, and you can see that compared to untreated cuttings in water, already we have more roots and higher root, uh, or longer, more roots and longer roots. So it uh, reinforces what I mentioned earlier. Capsule, water plus capsule in and of itself helps the propagation of cuttings. Um, if we add in some fungicide, if we add in the fungicide plus cytokinin plus uh, uh, rooting hormone, uh, we got an increase as well. Okay, so those did work. The biggest increase, of course, came when we added in the rooting hormone. Not terribly surprising, um, but uh, you can see that it helped quite a bit. Uh, in terms of getting more roots and uh, longer roots compared to the untreated cuttings. Uh, New Guinea impatience, uh, this is a faster to root one. Um, so we did not see as much difference. Uh, we did see, if you can see my cursor here, the capsule here, uh, it did better than the other control treatments. And then of course, with the rooting hormone, uh, this group of bars did much better, okay? And then finally, poinsettias. A little more variation here. Poinsettias are a little more delicate. Um, we can see the capsule helped, but the water treatment in and of itself also helped. 
uh, and we can see that the KIB, the KIBA um, plus the fungicide and fructose did well. And again, with fructose here, uh, and then of course the cytokine. So picking out the treatments that did better. All right, um, in summary, capsule improved turgor, allowing the cuttings to be more easily stuck. Uh, this will be particularly important with some of those very thin um, bedding plants. You know, geranium's not so bad, poinsettia is not so bad, but golly, some of those real thin cuttings can be a real pain if, they, if they're not completely uh, hydrated. We had positive results even with unstored cuttings. So it may be that you want to work this, the dips into the process no matter what, allowing cuttings to wilt, reduce blood quality. Not a big surprise there, but nevertheless, it was nice to, to see that documented. Uh, zero versus 30 minutes, uh, slightly less rooting. Um, I would say, you know, uh, we did not unfortunately have the time and the cuttings to be able to do intermediate dips. Um, but I would say probably an intermediate dip would work just as well as the 30 minute. Um, but keep that in mind. And I say slightly less rooting, so we got a little, little lower results. Um, but worst comes to worst, I would say a zero minute, you know, a quick dip uh, would work well also. But if you have the time, and, the, and set up the process, the longer durations would be better. In terms of specific recommendations for the big three that we tested, uh, New Guinean patients, any of the KIBA solutions did well. Uh, with geraniums and poinsettias, uh, the, the best solutions were those with the KIBA, either fructose or pageant or other fungicide, um, but you can do the fructose or pageant as well if you are applying your KB, KIBA differently. Um, we got benefits from the addition of just wetting agent or individual compounds. So it's a matter of putting them all together. As always, with any research, we strongly encourage you to test it uh, yourself on your operation to see what you get. Uh, you may find that not all the compounds will work for you um, and you may wanna come up with different recipes, uh, but these are what worked for us and we hope will give you a good start uh, in terms of trying to uh, figure out what to do there. I will mention that um, we often read in the literature, in some of that literature, I have to admit I have written about the concerns of dipping cuttings with pathogens. Uh, we did not see um, any greater levels of pathogens in the propagation. Um, so I think it has to do with the fact that we had clean cuttings coming in. So I would watch that. Um, and the, the dips were not very, very long. So if you're concerned about that, uh, we did not see problems uh, from spread of pathogens using the dips. So I would strongly recommend you try them. I know a number of growers are already, uh, propagators are already using the dips. So I'll go ahead and give that a try. Uh, with that, I'd like to wrap it up and just uh, give some acknowledgements here. Uh, Diane Mays uh, for all the propagation and data collection and Syngenta flowers. Uh, for providing the cuttings. Okay, um, I know this is American Floral Endowment a seminar, but this one, this project was funded by the American Floral Endowment as well, uh, the, the cutting recovery. And uh, we're just very pleased and very thankful for the cutting. Um, the project worked out great, not all projects do. So it's really fun when they do. And we appreciate the American Floral Endowment being able to make that happen. Um, and again, we appreciate our sponsors for this seminar, Above Floral Plant and Darwin Perennials. And to put in a plug for the next upcoming seminar, Nutrition of Floriculture Crops, February 22 at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, with that, I thank you again for your attention. I know we're heading into the busy season here, so I appreciate y'all taking time to join us today. And I'd like to go ahead and take any questions that you might have. Thank you again. All righty. Thank you, John, for your presentation. And there's a couple questions that we are going to start with. Uh, one that I see in the chat is, um, do you do any dips with pesticide, say for white fly and poinsettias? Uh, would you have a recommend recommendation on what to try? We actually did not do uh, insecticides in the dips. Um, I understand that others have. Uh, as I put in the chat, I always worry about REI in those, in those cases. Um, but maybe if 
any of the folks on this call have had success uh, with adding an, uh, an insecticide for whiteflies and dips, if they could go ahead and post that in the chat, uh, that'd be great. Again, we didn't specifically look at that, unfortunately. Good question, though. Okay, and the next question is, uh, did you spray any of the solutions instead of dipping, or do you know of any research using that type of technique? Certainly. Um, in this particular experiment, we only did dips. Um, I do know that Jim Faust has done a fair amount of work looking at sprays, and I think he's had quite a bit of success with that. Um, I'm not sure where you would find that information. I know he's, I think he's done a couple of articles, maybe in one of the trade journal magazines. Um, but yeah, Jim Faust has done that. And uh, in particular with uh, spraying of the rooting hormone uh, has gotten very good results from that. So yeah, it's, um, it's been done. All right, and then one in the question answer group, um, would succulents take well to storage uh, on bench or in a cooler? Oh, succulents. Yeah, succulents are so hot right now. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, there's a one of my woman in my office that just loves succulents, and she's always she's always buying buying them. Um, you know, uh, succulents are particularly prone to rotting. Uh, they are not. Um, you know, they. How can I say this? You know, they're they're well set up for handling dry weather, dry air, um, and in fact, some of the succulents we tend to leave out a little bit after we harvest the cutting, so to speak, uh, to let them callus over. Otherwise, they may end up rotting. Having said that, they can be very sensitive to moisture during the storage process. Um, so. Um, I would say from my limited experience, because we've not done work on them, uh, putting them on the greenhouse bench without mist or in high humidity uh, would be fine. Um, hopefully somebody who has done more, has more experience with succulents can chime in here. Um, but I would be worried about rotting from too much moisture uh, with succulent cuttings. On the other hand, they are a plant material and you can overdo it as well. So it's a balance there of making sure that um, uh, that they stay turgid, um, but yet do not have free water on them that could cause them to rot. Linda, you're nodding your head. Do you have some experience? Do you want to chime in here? Oh, no, I'm just agreeing. Uh, okay. listening to. <laughs> All right. I thought maybe you had had work, work, you'd had done some work with them. All right. Uh, oh, next question. Uh, from which country was the URC coming from? Oh, golly. Um, I think it was Guatemala, if I remember correctly. But we were we had a number of experiments going on and we we're getting cuttings from several places. So, um, but I think it was Guatemala. All right. And next question. Uh, what about the effects of ethylene in propagation? Yeah, you know, ethylene um, is, is a major, can be a major problem. You know, keep in mind that we use ethylene during the production of unrooted cuttings by spraying it on, on some of the stock plant species uh, to help uh, keep the flowers down so that the plants do not spend more time uh, putting energy into flower buds. And those flower buds on cuttings, uh, they also tend to rot pretty easily uh, so we like to have a nice clean cutting without any flower buds on it. So ethylene in that situation is very good. Um, as soon as we harvest the cutting though, um, it becomes a race against senescence, in which case then ethylene typically is not a good thing. Uh, some of the, you know, portulaca, which I mentioned earlier in the presentation, lantana, uh, and a couple of others are both very prone to ethylene, since ethylene damage uh, by causing the leaves to drop off. And, as you might expect, cuttings without leaves tend not to root very uniformly. Um, so other, other issues we sometimes run into are death of the meristem and just unevenness. Uh, ethylene uh, can cause just a general unevenness. And of course that can be a real problem uh, if you're trying to do large quantities of cuttings and trying to do them, uh, get a good nice product uh, after you're done. So, um, some of the cuttings are shipped with anti, you know, MCP, uh, anti-ethylene sachets, MCP to help keep 
ethylene problems down. Uh, so yeah, it can be a problem. I didn't talk too much about it because we didn't address it um, in our in that particular set of studies, but we have looked at ethylene in other studies. It looks like the May webinar will address dips for white flag control on poinsettia cuttings. Perfect. Uh, everybody should be sure to write that in their calendar. Uh, that's that's a great one. Perfect. All right, the next question, uh, does the quality of water in the dips matter? You know, uh, the, the, as long as the water is suitable for growing the plants, it's gonna be suitable for the dips. Um, so in general, we don't, um, uh, you know, very high EC water, which not too many folks have. Um, folks who do have very high EC water, such that it causes problems for plant production, uh, they're typically going to do something to bring that EC down. Um, you know, they may do reverse osmosis and blend it in uh, to bring the EC down. So whatever water is used for the production uh, should be fine to use for the dips. Uh, one of the folks in the have seen uptake tetra curb and Safoil X used for insect pest control. Uh, uptake, there we go, and tetra curb, I believe, have a zero hour REI, uh, the softer chemicals. So, yeah, good. Thank you for that. All right. And I think we have one last question, unless uh, anyone wants to add any more in the chat. But uh, what species can be dip, can the dips be used in, additional to impatiens, geraniums, and poinsettias? Uh, we have done some trials on various other species and had pretty good luck with, with just about everything. Um, where the, the technique runs into problems are with the species that have a lot of hairs on the foliage, some of the helichrysums in particular. Um, literally, the dip water does not get in through those hairs to contact the stem very well. Uh, so, so that can be a problem. Uh, the really tiny cuttings, nemesia, diacea, stuff like that can be very helpful, um, especially like I mentioned earlier uh, with just using the wetting agent because that can make them more turgid and easier to stick. Uh, so that can help. Uh, I see there is a comment. I assume that's from Allison Carlson. Syngenta cuttings came mainly from Mexico. So I guess probably was Mexico rather than Guatemala. So thank you for that. Okay, and then are the rainy season, is the rainy season in Africa, uh, does that affect the quality of the URC cuttings? Oh boy, that's a great question. Um, you know, um, with cut flowers, we, we do a lot of work with cut flowers and there's been a fair amount of work showing that the environmental conditions, in particular the humidity that cut flowers are grown under, uh, can influence how they are handled and influence um, how they survive the care and handling. In particular, plant cuts grown under very high humidity, uh, the stomates don't work very well. The stomates don't close as readily. And of course, when you harvest a cut flower, and the same thing would be for a cutting, when you, you cut it off from its water source, uh, you want those stomates to close uh, to be able to keep the rest of the water inside uh, the, the plant material. So I would think that we would see some of the same issues that cuttings grown under high humidity uh, would have some of the same post-harvest issues uh, in terms of uh, uh, not having good, uh, you know, the stomates not working too well. Having said that, uh, the cuttings are usually packed in bags, although the bags do have holes in for some air exchange, um, which should keep the humidity fairly high. But yeah, that's a really good question. Um, be fun to check into that. I'm not sure if anybody has. Another comment that we suffer from end of November to December, pretty low carbohydrates due to low light. Ooh, yeah. Another good comment there. There's been some great work uh, showing that low carbohydrate status of cuttings will, of course, make it harder for them to propagate. Uh, they also don't survive the shipping process as well. In particular, cuttings that go into that whole process with low carbohydrates, if the shipment warms up, uh, they're going to lose what cut carbohydrates they do have pretty quickly. Uh, so yeah, that, that can be an issue. What you would have to do in that situation is one, either try to increase the light, which is not so easy um, because of the cost of electricity, 
uh, in terms of trying to add any extra light, um, but making sure the glazing is clean as possible during that time of the year. And then they're gonna have to be very careful about the cold chain management of cuttings that are harvested during the low light time of the year uh, to ensure that they keep as much of that carbohydrates uh, when they get to the final propagator as possible. So yeah, yeah, great, great comment, great question. All right, we have another question. Um, uh, do the sticking, sticking substrates also affect performance uh, if you are C? And if so, what kind of substrates work better? Yeah, that's another good one. Um, yeah, that sure can. Um, it has to do with the, the oxygen levels in the substrate. Um, and there have been folks who've done quite a bit of work on that. If, if they're on, if, uh, they're welcome to put in the chat because uh, they probably know better than I. But um, in general, you want uh, good oxygen levels, good aeration in the substrate. And that can be particularly important because um, if you're propagating into plugs, uh, you know, especially some of these smaller plugs, they have a very short drainage column. You know, so there is, though in that situation, the substrate tends to hold a lot of moisture already, which means you need to air more. On, yeah, I didn't mean to make that pun, but anyway, we'll go with it. Air more on the side of having more aeration uh, in the plug. Um, so you would want to use a substrate with as much aeration as possible. Uh, having said that, if you use a substrate with a lot of aeration, uh, then when you bring it out of the propagation environment, it will tend to dry out a little quicker. So it's a, you know, as so many things in floriculture are, it's a matter of balancing uh, one aspect with the other. But yeah, you want to make sure you have good aeration in the substrate, and that's particularly important with small plugs. All right, I think that is all of the questions. Um, unless anyone has any last ones to share. Uh, so Going with less. that, Going yeah, twice. I think. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I <was> just <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so thank you for joining us today for another session of AFE's Grow Pro webinar series. Uh, join us next month with Dr. Garrett Owen, who will be presenting on the nutrition of floriculture crops, which will be on February 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, remember to register at endowment.org slash grow pro. And while you're here, check out our past webinar rec uh, recordings, other grower related resources, and research reports available to you for free thanks to industry support. Uh, we ask that you please complete the brief survey about today's session where you can suggest additional topics and help us continue to improve these webinars. Uh, thank you again to John and uh, thank you to all of us for joining us and everyone have a great day. Thank you all. I enjoyed it. Appreciate it.